No, get it. Are we ready? Okay. Actually, what I'm, I'm going to start off with a couple of the little things, and then I'll get into uh, the 7QP event. But there's a couple other things here on the agenda that I would like to go uh, go after first. And so one of the things that um, we should have up on the screen there is something talking about FCC exposure rules. One of the things that came out in this week's, this month's uh, QST um, was a long article on um, getting up to speed on this. So about two years ago, actually a little over two years ago, I did a program on new rules for uh, RF exposure. And so the FCC has given the amateur radio community two years to come up, come into compliance for the new RF exposure rules. So that time has now passed. That was May 3rd, 2023. So it was a few weeks back. So every amateur radio station must be in compliance at this point in time. Now, I don't know, if, I haven't, didn't look to see if there was any, uh, um, if they were gonna penalize you if you weren't in compliance, but uh, it's probably pretty important that you do end up going through there. It's anytime you change your antenna, anytime you change anything where it can change your radiation, move to a different place, add antennas, take antennas, well, not, don't have to worry about taking antennas down, but if all of a sudden you got um, a few extra, a couple thousand dollars, and you bought, went out and bought a brand new amp, well, what the heck does that do for RF exposure? So I want to make everybody aware that as of um, May 3rd, there's a set of rules that um, the FCC thinks that they can enforce, and I don't know how they're going to enforce it. So if you want to get the latest information, take a look at QST May edition uh, 2023, page 64. You'll find the whole article there on FCC exposure rules. So please, everybody, um, 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 think about that and uh, get that. Uh, make, make sure you go through and do your documentation, do your research, see that everything is working correctly. So I'm going to get out of this and I'm going to switch to a different screen. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the 7QP contest. So before we get into the nitty gritty about this, um, I'd like to talk a little bit a, f a month or so back, I did a program on bandpass filters and about the importance of bandpass filters, how they work, how to evaluate those things. And so it was kind of interesting in the 7QP event, we grabbed some bandpass filters, got one of our, one of our little uh, uh, VNA uh, network vector analyzers, those nice little small guys. And we went through there and measured some of those. And it was very surprising to see all the variations that you have between different manufacturers and how they end up building ones, building these bandpass filters. And for some people, when they actually saw the pictures on the uh, VNA on how that thing worked and how it attenuated signals, some of us were very surprised that you know, even the throwing big, big money at big high power ones doesn't mean that you're going to get a better quality picture, but um, or better quality bandpass filter. But they're still very important to have, and we need to have have them around whenever we have a, a large number of people or any kind of number of people where you have transmitters in close proximity of each other. So let's talk about this year's contest. So. Not everybody got a chance to uh, go on this uh, wonderful trip. So let's talk a little bit about history and some of the things that go on. So this is held annually. It's on first Saturday in May. Stations in the U.S. 7th area, call area. That's Arizona, Idaho, Montana, Nevada, uh, Nevada Oregon, Utah, Washington, and Wyoming. So everybody that has that 7 in, that call, in your call, call sign, 
um, is part of the uh, these these uh, states here. For stations outside of the seventh all area, counties become multipliers. So counties within the seventh area call area become multipliers. Every county you get, you get a multiplier, and that's a big incentive to seek out every county within the seventh area uh, call area. County objectives to get 259 counties in eight states. So there's 259 counties out there in eight in the eight states in the seventh area. So that's the goal is to get uh, both for to activate those counties and also to try and contact. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. I don't know. They've never really got 100% of those things. Pretty close, but never, never 100%. So the contest starts at 6 a.m. in the morning, really early, and it ends at midnight. So it's an 18-hour contest that all takes place in one day. It's one long, long, grueling day, but it's um, always interesting about all the things that go on. So some counties in the seven area are the most sparsely populated counties in the U.S., and uh, it's... There are some real ones. I mean, there's more cattle out in some of these country counties than there are population. So the best effort was 209 counties out of 256 counties activated. Some counties have never been activated. Kind of interesting. So if you want more details to see what's going on, there's the website. Just actually drop in 7QP in your web browser, and you'll get the get a link there to go to this uh, website to find out what's going on. So let's take a look on where we are. You see the big old star out there in the middle of Oregon, pretty almost in the middle of it. So this event that uh, we, orga we organized and took place is sitting on the county line between Wheeler and Crook County. Believe me, there's not much in Wheeler out there. There's not a whole lot of Crook, but far less in Wheeler. So this year, our base camp, um, like in past uh, number of years, was at the Walton Lake Snow Park. That's out in the Ochoco National Forest. It's at an elevation of 5,500 feet. So we're way up in the air. Uh, so I end up working with the service, well, Forest Service to get from, uh, permission to use that. Um, and there wasn't any fee, no cost to it. We um, have a, a pit toilet there. We have a warming hut which is very, very valuable. Uh, reasonable ground for putting up tents and plenty of space for RVs and campers. On the ridge with good, so up on this ridge, we have really good visibility, 360 degrees all around. Good flat space, lots of good visibility. And the other cool thing is that we have some really nice tall trees for hanging up wire antennas, which is very convenient. So we're also on a two county line. Uh, which is really cool between Crook County and Wheeler County. So that means everybody that contacts us um, gets double the points. It's one contact and they get to get two counties at the same time, two multipliers. So it's about in the middle of Oregon. The, this event is about in the middle of Oregon. Oregon. Wheeler County population is 1,375 people. Crook County is 20,000, actually about 21,000 at this moment. <coughs> Uh, from uh, home in Corvallis to the activation zone, it's about 175 miles or about um, uh, almost five hours to get there. And that depends on what route to take it. So the nice part is all roads are paved. You don't have to get out and go across any dirt roads. So if you get on a dirt road, that means you're lost. So here's a uh, bird's eye view of what the uh, area looks like. You can see a pond here to the left. So we have all that big area over there for um, parking RVs and campers and stuff like that. This little um, hut over here on the right side or just to the right of the uh, pin there from Walt Lake, that's our outhouse. And then right north of that or up from that is another building and that's a warming hut. It's a log cabin, has a picnic table in it and a great big old wood stove in there. And we also have more parking to the north of it that we put other campers in there for activating. So um, objectives of this event. It's always important to re remember we have objectives. The 
First one is to have fun. Second one is to maximize contest points by being on multiple by being on a multi-county line. Uh, and also the next objective is be the uh, first place for the 7QP contest for our class. And we are an expedition class unlimited power. So participants was Anna, Scott joined us, Anthony, Paul, Don and Betsy were there. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Betsy had a little bit of problem and thank goodness uh, got her the right help at the right time. Got Drew, Warren, Ron Post, and I actually showed up. So a couple of the high level points here, food was phenomenally good, really good. Uh, Paul did a superb job of providing us a really good uh, selection of food. None of us uh, at all went hungry. We had more food than we knew what to whip, do with. Being with a group of about, I don't remember, 10 or 12 hams for a weekend, can't ask for a better, better situation where everybody was all ham related and uh, ham, ham, ham. And it was really just good being with some really good hams out there. Contest was exciting. Yeah, it was exciting. Exciting. Band conditions, well, they were terrible. So one of the things that uh, has happened this year, every major contest, the WPX worldwide, all the big international contests that were going on, one thing that happened, it always seems like, so what happens two days before any major contest that we have had this year. We have a big CME. So when that CME happens, it takes about two, two days before, two to three days before that blast of plasma and all that debris comes along, screws up our magnetosphere, screws up our ionosphere, and propagation goes to hell. We had, becoming in before that, we had two solid weeks of really, really great prop, uh, propagation. 15 meters was open way into the, you know, I should say 20 meters was open almost all night long. 15 meters was open well into the evening. 10 meters was open all day long. Really, really good propagation. So two days before it, we had a big CME and that ended up screwing up our uh, um, propagation really, really bad. And we'll look at some of the details shortly here. So the other thing that was kind of interesting is that uh, when we woke up on Sunday morning, boy, did we have a surprise. So this is what it looked like Sunday morning when we, we woke up. We had about nine plus inches of snow on the ground. Uh, this is Warren's camper out there. Uh, you can see his wheels dug into the snow there. And the first thing we realized as we were packing up on Sunday morning, none of our slide ins would, would roll back into the, the uh, RVs. So we had to clear all the snow off of all the slide ins in order to get those slide ins to retract. Um, and then Anna's camper is right behind uh, Warren's there. Uh, Here's Scott's truck. Here's um, uh, Ron's post. You can see all the snow on top of that. That's my camper there with a nice lot, bunch of snow setting on that. The slide outs on the other side. So we had to end up uh, cleaning. I had to climb, cl clear enough space up on top of the camper so I could climb up on top of the camper to get around to clearing the snow off the slide out before I could get that to retract. Here's the entrance of um, the um, <clears throat> warming hut there, and you can see all the snow wrapped around it. So it was really nice. Um, I think Warren brought up the ideal, um, but correct me if I'm wrong, but what we did was kind of uh, got everybody all cleared up, got our, all the equipment down, everything packed up, and then we did a convoy out of there all the way down out of the snow. And we had a head person that scouted in front of us that told us what the road conditions were doing. Uh, that was Anthony out there. And then um, 
I think Scott was at the tail end of things and uh, all the campers and RVs were in between and we all worked out, came out of there very slowly, very easily. And we had absolutely no problems at all. We're a little late getting out of there, but it was funny as we went down the road going into Pineville, everybody was pointing at us and we left this big long string of uh, ice and snow and water that was flowing behind us there. It was pretty funny there. But so that was our other big surprise. So after this, you know, we always talked about being on an expedition. This is considered like an expedition, but it doesn't have any of the frills or any of the, the drama like Beauvais had this year. But this is the first year that we really had gnarly weather that really made it a little bit challenging that everybody had to step up their, their game on trying to get things packed up and put, put back together. I know I had almost knee-high boots, calf, way up calf-high boots, and I was trudging through snow. When I tried to retrieve my antenna, I had snow all the way up to my my groin and trying to push through those snow drifts. So it, there was a lot of snow up there, and it was no, no fun. It was gorgeous if you want to stand around, but we had to get packed up and get out of there. So let's take an um, – oh, yeah. So now we know what it's like to be on on a real expedition. And I'll say real, real. I mean, it was it was a lot more drama than any of us had any 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 way planned on. The snow report said we were supposed to get between two, maybe three inches of snow on Sunday night, and that was what I expected to see on the ground. Nothing to be concerned with. Not nine inches. So let's take a look at numbers. Here's a nice little spreadsheet that kind of breaks things down by year by year. So this whole thing kind of started back in about 2014. Um, you can see our, the first row there is these are our submitted scores, not our final score. I still have not submitted the logs. I have till Wednesday to submit it. So I wanted to make sure that nobody else had any issues with what we had have posted at this point in time. But the interesting thing, comparing our, I mean, this year we worked hard. There was a lot of stuff going on and we made a lot of contacts out there. But our score wasn't that much different than 22. I mean, it was better, but not that much different. MT stands for malts. Those are the multipliers. So last year we had 58. This year we only got 56, slightly different. CW. Um, I still am scratching my head. I don't understand why, but the CW, we've made a huge effort. Both Ron and Scott uh, worked real hard, but there wasn't a huge difference in CW context. In phone, um, they don't count as much, but we made a huge improvement on phone. Uh, Anna just absolutely slammed huge amount of context down. Really, you know, worked really hard at that. Digital, we didn't do any digital modes up there, so no PSK or any of those kinds of uh, digital modes. So our total number of contacts, um, you know, it only it changed by about 150, 150 or more contacts. So I'm still scratching my head, and I looked around for other answers and still haven't figured out why, what's what happened. So last year we got second. This year, obviously, our logs haven't been submitted, so nothing has been graded. So I don't know what our what place that we came in, and we will uh, we'll all eventually. It'll take a few months before that stuff gets posted, and I'll let everybody know what happens there. So everybody um, sees what we look what happened on scores, even though that we put a lot of effort into things this year. I'm still kind of stuck on why things just didn't significantly improve. Oh, well, actually, I have some other things that'll be coming up that'll help help understand. So for this year, this is what things look like. Um, for 80 meters, we actually got some contacts out of that uh, for on CW. Um, on 40 meters, I think 40 meters, we did better last year on CW for um, <clears throat> for uh, 40 meters, 20 meters. 
I think that was probably similar to what, what we did. Now, when we talk about phone, you can see, I think last year we had probably another 100 points, 100 contacts on, uh, on 80 meters. I think 40 meters was a little bit better, but we didn't come anywhere close to the score for a phone on 20 meters. The other interesting thing is on 15 meters, you can see 15 meters this year, we only made a few contacts there. Last year, we made a lot more contacts on 15 meters. And I think we may even made a few contacts on 10. So this year, 15 meters basically shut down. You can see we didn't even get any phone contacts on 15 meters. These were only CW contacts. So that's kind of a breakdown on the modes by band. Uh, this is last year's at 2020. So um, you can see we've made a, a lot of 20 meter contacts there. Um, you can see that also on, um, yeah, on uh, 80 meters, a lot more contacts there. So that helped it up. But we still didn't come anywhere close to this uh, single sideband contacts on 20 meters like what we did this year. But we did do a little bit better. Actually, it doesn't look like it did that much better on 15 meters. So anyway, I, I can share these, I can send this stuff out so everybody can take a look at this and then they can scratch their own head and, and make, make their own observations on what happened there. Let's see what happened here. Come on. Why did, there we went, screwy. Okay, so those were the numbers out there. And hmm. I had more slides. I wonder what happened to this. I had a bunch of other information that I had included there, and I don't see it. So um, anyway, that was this is that's the uh, kind of program for uh, this evening. And I'll go back to say ask see if anybody else had any comments about the expedition for this year. Sorry, I missed. There was some reason I don't have a bunch of other slides in there. Any comments? Well, I'll say for my first one, it was sure a heck of an experience. A lot of fun, isn't it? I mean, you can see the planning. Um, you can see, I mean, we had, what, five, um, was it seven? Seven wire antennas up in the air. Anna brought her hex beam up there. That performed remarkably well. That gave us a little gain, a little directionality. It works oh. remarkably well when it's upright. <laughs> well, I made I, my last five QSOs with it pointing towards the sky. Really? Did, do you want to explain what happened there so I don't get it messed up? Uh, the snow brought it down. So there was enough snow load on the wires of the hex beam. And I mean, it's a temporary thing. So it got heavy enough that pulled out one of the stakes and um, it fell over. Um, I broke two spreaders. So we're going to have to replace those before it's ready to go for field day but yeah the snow did not do it any favors overnight so i uh, wondered why i was not getting really good you know suddenly the band was all dead and everything and you know eked out five more contacts and then when i shone the flashlight out at because you can't really see in the dark at that point in time all the way out to your antenna i noticed that it was down on the ground so when I got it, to, you know, I had a little bit harder time than some of the other folks getting that things down because both of my antennas were ground mounted. So I literally had to dig the radials or for the vertical out of a foot of snow um, and try and get to the radial ring on the bottom and find tent stakes in a foot of snow and stuff like that. So it wasn't pleasant trying to un untangle all the wires that were uh, tangled up in the uh, the hex beam because when the hex beam loses its hex, it kind of, uh, yeah, becomes a tangled mess a little bit. So Sunday morning, morning was not a good time for me. In fact, uh, my fingers up till yesterday were still tingling because of dealing with all that ice cold snow. So uh, 
it, uh, it, my fingers got a little bit messed up in that. I did want to give a special thanks to Mike and to Paul for planning and food and all that. Just thank you again. You're very welcome. That goes into this. Yeah, but it's my pleasure. I I enjoy helping to organize that, and I enjoy really enjoy seeing everybody having lots of fun and uh, being involved in the competition and everything that goes on there. So I I that's it's I get a lot of enjoy of enjoyment out of that. Anthony, what was your experience there? Uh, pretty good. And that's having the the heater in in the tent was a really good idea. Um, <laughs> we, I, I, I kind of made a loop around and about 10 p.m. and uh, was shutting some of my stuff down. Found out that because uh, I mean bands had been good on me so i just found out that scott had been using my antenna when i had kind of unplugged some stuff to kind of get some stuff out of the way with the snow coming down and he's like what are you doing i'm like i, I didn't know you're using my antenna and he's like well why are you putting it away i'm like look outside and he's like oh so uh i think most of most of the operations were wrapped up a little after 10 p.m um just because at, at that point it's like we're gonna try and protect what equipment we can as best we can and get, get people back in uh, in their shelters without having to navigate stuff uh, too late at night with with the snow coming down. Yeah. So how did how did your tent fare with all that snow that came down? I had a lot of people ask questions and I didn't get a chance to see what happened. Uh, it did pretty well. Um, with with the heater in there. It was getting snow load was getting pretty heavy on it, uh, not enough to be noticeable from a uh, from a structural standpoint. Uh, so I checked on it fairly early when the snow started coming down, and because of that, I decided that there was enough snow building up that I was going to try and clear off what I could, get the heater uh, going so that I'd have a warmish tent to get into, um, and ended up that knocked enough snow off the roof onto the sides that by the time I had gone in and helped Scott get shut down for the night, that the snow had blocked off all of the ventilation around the bottom. And so <laughs> my CO detector was not happy. Uh, so I ended up having to shovel all the snow that I had knocked off earlier away from the base of the tent, get the ventilation going again, get the uh, get the CO detector happy. And then after, after I got all that stuff cleared away, uh, I was able to, any snow that came down was melting. Uh, and so I was getting the snow melt off the top of the tent and that kept a, a nice open area for the ventilation. So I never had, my CO detector didn't go off again until, <laughs> until we were packing up the next day. Uh, when I had the, the next day, as we were getting everything out, I had the, a little electric heater that I had plugged into trying to turn off the last of fuel and generator. And so I ended up uh, setting the generator on the tailgate of the truck and running an extension cord into the cab mm. with a heater there <laughs> and just had that going and had the, the CO detector was in the front of the cab and it was not particularly happy with or in the, in the cab in the bed. Um, with the canopy on the truck, it was not happy uh, being in the confined space with the exhaust of the generator blowing into the the bed of the truck. So, um, but fortunately, there's nobody that was trying to occupy that space when that was happening. Wow. So, were, hey, go ahead. I was going to say you were real close to having an igloo. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, otherwise, I was warm and toasty. It was great. Hey, Warren, can you uh, unmute there and uh, join the conversation and uh, maybe just add a little little bit about your experience? Let's see. Like Warren we... was reconnecting to the. Yeah. Yep. So are you there, Warren? Looks like you left Ron still up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually Ron's background is the uh, inside of the warming hut. hut up there. So, yeah, Warren, your uh, your audio is all distorted at this point. Yeah, 
Yeah, Warren, your your audio is all distorted at this time. Looks I'm like really have... glad I decided to rent a trailer this year. Let me say that. Oh, you bet. Uh, yes, I you you really came up with the right solution at the right time. Timing was everything on that. So um, on all the stats and stuff that I kind of showed showed there, um, any other comments that you want to throw in there before we finish up on this subject there? How am I supposed to get How the largest I, ego yeah. ever when you don't show the operating stat, yeah. operator stats? I mean, I wanted to see, you know, how many QSOs, you know, I, I ranked. Because that's part of what this is all about, right? Yep. I have to beat Scott. I will fix that up and get that sent out. Uh, my humble apologies. I, obviously, I don't know what I did there. <laughs> so I'll um, get those stats for everybody. So Warren, are you uh, operational now? No. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you now. Okay. I don't know what's going on. With... You have two, you have two, two connections. Open. Yeah, you have two events. You have two connections open there. And so you're getting feedback through that second connection. So, Ron, any other thing that you wanted to throw out there? Oh, just the uh, maybe next year I can keep up with Anna. But, uh, you know, th this was my first contest where I did CW. And uh, Scott helped me start in a couple months ahead of time to prep for it. And uh, with Morris Runner and Matt, and I, I really appreciated his help um, leading me to the right thing. And, uh, um I had a, had a great time. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. So next year, I don't know that I'll park in front of the door on the hill, you know, just in case we have 12 inches of snow again. I was a little concerned about you getting out of there, but you managed to wiggle around enough to get, get enough traction to get out of that place. But yeah, well, I good bought new, new tires before I went, and I'm glad I did because I would not have got out with my old tires. Yeah. Okay, Warren, it looks like you got rid of your second in, uh, second incident there of, of uh, Zoom there. Want to give that a try? Go ahead and un unmute yourself there. Now you're back muted again. There you go. All right. Very good. Sorry about all that. I had a lot of fun. Uh, really enjoyed it. I... Uh, the weather was great except for Saturday when my awning collapsed on my trailer. I didn't enjoy that. Um, the 12 to 14 inches of snow on Sunday, I thought that was pretty good. Put a lot of uh, new equipment to the whole trip. And off the arms and everything, that was good. I thought the food was fantastic. And uh, we had a real good trip. I'm glad Bessie's going to be all right. Uh, really enjoyed putting up those antenna wires. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. And uh, overall, I thought it was a real good trip. So glad I went. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, I would have Drew in there too. Drew was uh, logging for me, and uh, that was really good. In that. So, uh, just wish we would have had a little bit of band conditions. I think we could have uh, done better. I mean, things were really off and on all, the whole time. So I think that impacted us quite a bit. This, you know, the sun just was cooperating for us, really. 